from WRAL News Headquarters in Raleigh, your number one source for local news. WRAL News, coverage you can count on. Tropical storm Nicole is headed for Florida right now and then it heads to North Carolina late this week. I'll show you when it arrives here and when we'll see impacts in North Carolina coming up. Plus, we have the Triangle's largest team of reporters tracking breaking developments in the midterm election with many key races still undecided this morning. We're watching the impact of local and national races as votes are tallied. Some votes are still coming in this morning. Thanks for joining us on your Wednesday. I'm Michelle McConaughey and I'm Jeff Hogan. It is great to have you along here and uh, Amy Wilmoth in the WR Severe Weather Center. Not just clouds here, but we are tracking the tropics and it's almost landfall time down there, right? Getting close. It's moving over the northern islands of the Bahamas right now as a tropical storm. It has winds at 70 miles per hour, so pretty close to a hurricane at this point. It's running into some shear, though, so it's not um, a guarantee that it's going to become a hurricane, but it could. It's going to be pretty close. It is still forecast to become a Category 1 hurricane within the next few hours as it moves over the northern islands of the Bahamas. And then once it makes landfall overnight tonight, very early uh, Thursday morning, it weakens to a tropical storm over Florida. And then it makes that turn to the north and east. It moves through North Carolina through the day on Friday. And again, this morning, the track has shifted to the west, so likely to have some fairly big impacts across the North Carolina mountains with some heavy rain and perhaps some areas of flooding. Here locally, we're most concerned about the risk for severe storms and some wind gusts as well. We do have a level two risk for severe storms across the entire viewing area through the day on Friday. Some isolated tornadoes will be possible. We're going to be east of the center of circulation. That's typically where we get some rotating storms with these tropical systems. This is a live look at North Hills right now. Beautiful out there. It is definitely on the cool side, feeling like fall temperatures are in the 40s still in Roxborough, 52 in Raleigh. It's 57 degrees right now in Fayetteville. It is breezy too. We have wind gusts right now at 33 miles per hour in Fayetteville. It's going to stay breezy through the day today. It also stays mild. Our high temperature climbs into the mid 60s this afternoon. All right, thank you, Amy. And there are some big developments underway across the country as we get more results from the midterm elections. Voters, they have made their choices and the balance of power, it's shifting here in Raleigh, also in Washington. Ken Smith joins us now to break down this new makeup of Congress. Ken? And Jeff and Michelle, the balance of power is really the key piece of information that people are looking for this morning. We've got all that information right here. Uh, let's look at it by the numbers when we look at the U.S. House of Representatives. Republicans Republicans needed to pick up at least five seats to gain control of the U.S. House. You take a look at the big board right now, you can see they pulled seven seats, which means the Republicans likely will take control of the U.S. House of Representatives. A much different scenario playing out in the U.S. Senate. Republicans needed to gain at least one seat to take control of the U.S. Senate, but actually Democrats were able to pick up a seat when uh, Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman defeated uh, Republican Dr. Mehmet Oz. And it's important to note that that seat was formally held by Pat Toomey, a Republican who decided to retire. But a lot still needs to be decided right now. At least five races are undecided, too close to call right now. This includes Arizona, Wisconsin, Nevada, Alaska, Georgia. We'll keep an eye on those numbers. Ken, thanks. The U.S. Senate race here in North Carolina was one of the most closely watched races. Republican Ted Budd, Democrat Sherry Beasley had a hotly contested race to fill the seat being vacated by retiring Senator Richard Burr. WIR's Laura Levine joins us now in Raleigh, and this race has a big impact. Laura, tell us about it. It does, Jeff. Congressman Ted Budd claiming victory just before midnight, ensuring the GOP maintains control over both of those North Carolina Senate seats. Now, the Republican congressman walked through a crowd of people cheering last night uh, in Winston-Salem around 1145. Budd's four-point win over Sherry Beasley will keep GOP control of the seat currently held by Richard Burr. The win has national implications as Republicans look to take control of the U.S. Senate. In a speech last night, Beasley said she conceded to Bud in a phone call. I offered him my support and encouraged him to stand in the tradition of our state to be an independent leader that puts North Carolina first. And I hope he will. We spoke on the phone and I want to thank her for her service to our state and for running a spirited race. And finally, I want to thank the people of North Carolina for delivering this victory tonight, folks. 
And in his victory speech last night, he also thanked Donald Trump for his support and promised to counter President Joe Biden's political agenda. He also promised to cut down and reduce some of the government spending, support and improve uh, schools' choice and build the southern border wall. Laura Levine, WRL News, live in Raleigh. And some governor's races resulted in several historic firsts. Let's start with Army veteran and best-selling author Wes Moore. He was elected as Maryland's first black governor. He is also just the third black person to ever be elected governor of a state. We'll take you to Massachusetts now, where Maura Healy's victory broke two glass ceilings. She'll be the first female governor of Massachusetts, as well as the state's first openly lesbian governor. And former White House Press Secretary Sand Sarah Huckabee Sanders will be the next governor of Arkansas. She will be the first female to lead that state. All right, thank you, Renee. And Wake County will have a new sheriff, Willie Rowe, who served in the sheriff's office for 28 years and retired as a major, will now lead the agency. Rowe defeated Donnie Harrison, who was trying to get his job back. Harrison was Wake County sheriff for 16 years until he lost to current sheriff Gerald Baker four years ago. WRL's Nia Harden is giving us a look at new reaction from both law enforcement veterans. And she says, unlike in other races, these two get along. They're friends. The incoming sheriff, he worked under the former sheriff. They respect each other and have known each other for a long time. And even in the victory speech that the incoming sheriff made, he said that this was a vote for unity. Rose says he wants to bring people together. In his victory speech, he talked about reducing crime and enhancing public safety. He aims to create a unit of unarmed responders to address calls for mental health, drug addiction, and domestic violence. Rowe and Harrison have agreed on working together as a community to get things done. We will bring unity. We'll bring leadership by example. We'll bring, bring the um, expectations of people doing their job and being held accountable, an end of favoritism, the opportunity for people to advance, to be properly compensated, and to be appreciated and valued for the work they put in. And in our next half hour, we talk about the mayor's race for Raleigh. Mayor Marianne Baldwin has won. Coming up, we'll tell you about some of the challenges she's going to be facing when it comes to city council. Naya Harden, WRL News in Raleigh. We also have a lot more to cover on this impact of the midterm election coming up after the break, how the balance of power is shifting in North Carolina's General Assembly and what it means for key issues in our state. And later, what a Republican flip on the North Carolina Supreme Court signals for the months ahead. And for a deeper analysis of Republican victories here in North Carolina and what they mean for the future of the state's political landscape, you can head over to WRL.com. With pet food prices rising faster than the inflation rate, still ahead, we'll visit a pet food supplier to find ways to lower your costs. Republican state lawmakers fell just one seat short last night of winning super majorities in both chambers of the General Assembly, a threshold that would have allowed them to overturn Governor Roy Cooper vetoes and fully control the state's legislative agenda. Democrats cheered that small victory that protects the status quo, a Republican legislature and a Democratic governor who can block their proposals. It may not come down to be all that simple in the end. WRL state government reporter Travis Fain joins us now to break things down just a little bit further for us. Travis, first, what happened last night in these General Assembly elections? So Republicans needed to flip five seats to get that supermajority. Two in the Senate, three in the House. They flipped four. They got two in the Senate, two in the House. So they can't disregard the governor and just pass whatever they want. But the way this works in North Carolina is you don't simply need three-fifths of the legislature to overturn a governor's veto. You need three-fifths of the members who are present and voting on any given day. Republicans were one short, so with full attendance, they're one short. But that means attendance just became real, real important for every single member in a state legislature that meets almost year-round on an unpredictable schedule with part-time lawmakers. Yeah, exactly. You slip in and catch somebody off guard. There's no question. What sort of issues might Republicans press for change about? 
Well, it's interesting to see, you know, we'll have to wait and see how far they press things. They've sparred with the governor over the state budget. That's nothing unusual. Uh, education funding, that's always a flashpoint between Republicans and Democrats. Lawmakers often end up dangling local projects, uh, expensive ones. Sometimes we call that pork in politics to get a few Democrats to vote for their preferred budget so that they get these local projects. Uh, tax cuts, lawmakers already bake incremental cuts into the system for the next few years. They might try for more now. Uh, there are a handful of Republican measures on how teachers talk about race, sexuality at school. Those have been divisive bills. We expect them to come back up. Uh, these are things Cooper vetoes, Governor Roy Cooper vetoes. Maybe the big one on people's minds though, abortion. Surely Republicans will press for more restrictions. Uh, they might actually find just enough Democratic support to pass something over the governor's promised vetoes there. Uh, there will be a lot of pressure on just a handful of Democrats. It will be intense. Yeah, that is for certain there because that margin is just uh, so narrow. Uh, things can change on a daily basis. So, Travis, we appreciate the breakdown. No question this morning. You've been busy all night with that. And more analysis of the GOP's victories in the State House and Supreme Court and what they mean for the future of the state's political landscape. You can get all that by heading over to WRL.com.